Was there one before? Yeah. Yeah, so we record these and uh, publish them to YouTube. So if you've got an issue with that and don't want to be seen, I would just keep your camera off or uh, let us know. We can pause recording if there's anything you really need to, would like to keep off. But uh, anyway, this is building query for uh, January 29th. And as I was saying, um, particularly interesting update for anybody who's interested in data set automations. We've been showing wires uh, and ideas and concepts in the last couple of meetings, but this time I think we're gonna demo live code, um, showing how to set and forget and data set and have it update itself. Is that right? Is that promising too much? I think that's not promising too much at all. Cool. Um, yeah, and uh, with that, we can kind of jump right in um, as a demo for others. Uh, we have a bit of a demo already. If you have, uh, if you wanna know sort of what why we're doing this, last week we did a sort of last, um, call, we did a big overview of our shift into automation um, for query in 2021. Uh, and so we have a number of reasons why we want to do this. But today, we just want to show up the actual like where we are so far in terms of getting this project realized and get a bunch of feedback on that. Um, so many of the folks on the call are on the team realizing this, um, actually working on this project. Um, so we'd really love any feedback, uh, particularly from Bayou and Chris, who's, um, just to sort of like, so we'll do a quick rundown of what we made so far and uh, what we're thinking it'll be used for and what it'll be good for. Hopefully fill in the gaps because it's not totally finished uh, on like what else will be built in the future. And uh, we'll yeah, go from there. And, but wanna leave lots of time for questions today and lots of time for discussion. There's no such thing as a, a bad question here. This is very early. And so we're just trying to get as much early feedback as we can to make this thing useful. So with that, I will share a screen. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, can you see, uh, hopefully just a screen that shows data sets. Yes. Someone give me a thumbs up. Uh, right good. Cool. Awesome. Fantastic. So, uh, we're quick, we're tentatively calling this query Matic, uh, until we figure out the real name for it. Um, that's automatic query. Uh, and so here you can see a list of data sets that I have on my machine. And the one thing that we won't, I'm demoing this locally today, but this will actually be run as a cloud hosted service, basically a website that you can go to. And, um, uh, and do all of this from the web. And so we are looking at all this from a web browser. But in this case, I'm just looking at a list of my data sets and the difference between query now and query matic is these data sets can be automated. Um, and so for that, I'm gonna just sort of start from the top and hit the new data set button and show sort of the basic workflow here. So for now to sort of jog the idea, deal with the blank canvas problem. When you choose a new data set, we're gonna give you a set of templates that will let you sort of start with just to get your sort of like, get you dived in, dived in, get you in very quickly on an example of what kind of data sets you can automate. Uh, so in this case, I'm gonna choose, uh, there are a number of things that we can do. So we can query a database, to turn that into a data set, maybe scrape the web, turn HTML into a data set, do an, a series of API calls, turn that into a data set. In this case, I'm gonna go with CSV download. So once I click that, I'm brought to what we're calling our workflow editor screen. And so this is the like thing we've been spending a lot of time working on um, as it is to date. But there's sort of three main sections we see to a, a workflow, which is a set of triggers, which are things that can start off in automation. A script, which actually is code that transforms data from some source into a data set. And then on completion are completion hooks, which basically, hey, whenever this thing successfully creates a new version of a data set, what should happen? Um, and so some examples of that are, should we push to query cloud? Should we call a webhook, which is which might integrate with some other service? Or should we send off just like a basic email of what happened and to whom should we send that email? But the main event for now really is this actual script editor. And what, we've, what we're hoping to build is uh, with, a, with this workflow editor is a place where we can actually dry run these, test these scripts out, build them up and build them up and make them make sense. And once they sort of finish, we hit this deploy workflow button. And once it's deployed, we now have a workflow that will run according to whatever our automation triggers are. So in this example, I'm gonna run this script every hour and the script is broken up into four steps. The first is setup, which is just a basic, hey, what, what tools am I gonna to need to run this script? And then we have a download step, which is where we're actually gonna pull in data from external sources. So in this case, we are hitting a open data um, URL from the city of New York. And, and then finally, we're gonna transform that data. And in this case, it's quite basic. We're just gonna run and transform. Uh, the transform function is just gonna get the result from the download. 
and it's going to set the body of the data set to that result. And so this is pretty straightforward. We're just pulling a CSV file in. But the upside of this automation is query is going to, once we make this script query, we'll be able to just run this for us and check for changes on our behalf. Um, and so first we can dry run this just to get a sense of what that is. And so here we're actually, this is actually code running. So we, each of these checks is telling us what's going on. Uh, when the transform step completed, we get a nice preview of our data set, which is going to show the actual data that's coming in. And data sets are broken up into the components that query uses across uh, the board. So if I want to, I can actually prove that this is real code at the same time and set the meta title of this to be, uh, what are what this is? Uh, baby names, right? Um, yes, baby names in New York. If I rerun this, you'll notice here that there's no meta component. Try to run this. I've now set a meta component and we can see, cool, the title of this is as such. Um, once it, now that we know that the script works the way that, it, that we want it to, we've picked an hourly period to see. I actually think that checking this every hour, I don't think that this data set's gonna change every hour. So I'm gonna do every day. Um, I can then hit deploy workflow. And when this hits deploy, we don't have any fancy UI for this quite yet, but what has just happened in the background is we've created that data set, saved it, and now automated it in the background to rerun every day. And so this script will run basically 24 hours from now and check for any changes. And if there are any changes after running the script, it will make a new version and do any of the things we said in on completion hooks. And so our hope from there is what query can become is this very, this, this data set screen can become this very useful list of, hey, what do I have and what's changed? And we can actually have query do the work of keeping our data up to date for us. Um, for anybody who's worked with query data sets in the past, one of the biggest challenges is keeping things up to date. And so we're really trying to fix that really core problem of making a really useful, fresh data catalog by actually binding the code to update data sets to the data set itself and then schedule it. That's kind of what we have for now. I will leave screen share up and can answer any questions just by navigating. Actually, I'll stop screen share and take any questions that anybody has to start with. Uh, so is it like a notebook? Kind of, yeah. It's very similar to a notebook vibe, but we are hoping that you don't use it for exploratory data analysis, more for the transformation side of things. Uh, we can talk about the Starlark thing, which probably isn't part of your question, but uh, yeah, it's kind of like a notebook. You can add cells and remove cells, but each cell kind of has a special purpose. So you saw that we had the download step and that's actually just intended for doing downloading. And the transform step is just intended for actually shaping the data. Um, I, I'd chime in and say, uh, like we definitely made the user interface notebook-like, but um, the big difference is that there's a very clear uh, end state or final value that you should be getting towards uh, when you use our scripting environment. Um, so it's just, you know, it's it's a little more opinionated and is in, intended for you to, you know, at the end of all of your steps, produce a query data set um, or produce a tabular data set with, you know, metadata like Brennan just showed. Um, so very much notebook-like and notebooky in its, in its uh, user experience, but not quite a notebook. I see. Uh, is there any way to uh, like test the script locally before, or, or is like the interface the main uh, interface for prototyping the pipeline? Uh, so this whole thing you will be able to run locally. Um, so you can, and so basically you can take this entire thing and run it on localhost. Oh, nice. Um, um, yeah. So there's no there's no reason that you can't develop the whole thing on your local machine and then deploy it elsewhere. Um, that's very much part of the hope. Cool. Does that, and does that answer your question or were you more asking like, can I just compose like files together to, to make these scripts? Uh, that answered part of the question because when it comes to code, it's like, oh, like is query gonna be like a mini GitHub repo for these things too? Or, uh, or these are like less, like, like it's just like one script, uh, less structured with folders and like SQL scripts that we can call, like we can make complicated things. It's more like, oh, we are aiming for like a more straightforward uh, workflow. 
totally, totally that scene between like, do I need to bring GitHub into the mix or not for this? Um, yeah, and so that's a great chance to talk a little bit about Starlark and the, the sort of how this looks a little bit like Python, but actually isn't Python. Um, and each, so it's not intended that you would use a GitHub repo for this because the script is supposed to be self-contained and relatively small. Uh, and queries should bring all of that with it and actually versions the script itself with each data set. So you can change it over time and see those changes um, reflected back to you. Uh, but the other thing that we've sort of come up with here is, as you saw, the script runs, is gonna run a lot, right? It's gonna be a fairly, a fairly uh, common process that we're gonna constantly wanna use to check things. And for that, we've ended up building this syntax that looks a lot like Python, but under the hood is much more efficient to run um, using something called Starlark, which is, we don't need to get into it too much. It's just a dialect that is designed to look exactly like Python, but allows us to examine what that script is going to do in terms of the performance intensity of it. How much memory is it going to consume? How long is it theoretically going to run if you knew how long HTTP requests would take type stuff. But the big advantage that gives you is it means that the resources you need to run lots of these scripts are not super high. Uh, so it's very feasible for you to both run one of these querymatic automation instances locally. So your machine could do that. Um, where you could just have like 20 scripts that are on a schedule and constantly running and checking themselves because uh, their memory footprint will ideally be fairly small. Um, the other thing that it really helps with is just lots and lots and lots of scheduling. Um, so we're hoping to deliver an experience that feels a lot like Python, but isn't exactly Python. And yeah, um, yeah I'd love to know how that strikes you. Um, uh, my first impression is it kind of reminds me of uh, Databricks, uh, they're Spark notebooks and you can schedule them to run as scripts, but then there's also reports, graphs and all those things built in. And uh, yeah, it, it feels familiar. And then, then you can also trigger another workflow from another workflow. So you can like chain them together like DAGs. Uh, I, I don't know if this is something Querymatic is going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you've really hit the nail on the head. And the Databricks comparison is, is very close, I'd say. I see. Yeah, this is really awesome. Yeah, does it strike, strike you as useful? Like, what do you think? Are we, are we headed in the right direction? Um, I think it would cover um, some of the um, annoying, like teeny tiny uh, data cleaning steps that you still have to like, find a server and schedule it uh, with a Chrome job or uh, set up like a CI to run it. Uh, so, so I work for city planning and we are stingy. So we run a lot of these types of tiny scripts in GitHub Actions for free compute. And the benefit is we can just bring up a container and have whatever dependency we want in it. Uh, so, and, and we do a lot of geospatial stuff. So, so my only concern is how extendable is Starlog and like to which extent we can bring functionalities in Python to, um, to Starlog, yeah. That's a great question. Chris, do you wanna answer the geospatial side and things or do you want me to take it? I mean, I'll let you take it, but I, I guess I'll start by saying, you know, we can, we have, you know, it needs to be built. Um, but a lot of it can can be ported over uh, probably with some kind of ease. Uh, but yeah, we've already even had people like Starlark. Starlark's been around for a while. Starlark in query has also been around for several years. And, um, you know, we've had people who are early tinkerers that are spatially minded have also just already written the, uh, already written some spatial packages to do, you know, simple things like counting points and polygons or something like that. Um, so definitely not the same sort of full uh, suite of things you can find in the Python universe, but uh, basically our task is to pick and choose uh, what will be the highest priority, you know, most commonly used packages that we can bring in that will bring people the most benefit, which we would love to hear from you about what those are. Is it just right. GeoPanda? Is it GeoPandas or is it something else? I, I think just pandas and just pandas would solve probably 80% of the problem then GeoPandas would solve uh, some of the smaller problems because when we get data sets, we get uh, shape files. And 
I, it's just difficult to process anywhere. So, but but then GeoPandas kind of provides a really convenient uh, interface to process spatial data. But but then it's also a pain to install anywhere. So uh, when it comes to uh, geospatial, there's no easy way around it. But but definitely just having uh, something like pandas. Uh, would solve probably 90%, 80% of the problems. Great. That's, That's excellent, excellent feedback. Yeah, we're, we're already actively planning out a strict subset of the, of the Pandas API. Um, so we won't do the whole thing in one go, but we're going to get like, hey, everybody uses these 25 methods all the time. And so let's get those worked out properly and, and set up. And it, it'll... Ideally, we're planning it to be literally like copy and pasteable, where um, there are yeah, it should it should be all right, but there are some like small edge cases where it might not be possible in Starlark. But so far, I haven't found any. Um, but yeah, that's the hope is pandas, geopandas, um, some of the very common stuff. The other thing that you can do with Starlark is as we didn't really show it much here, but you can define all of your own functions inside of Starlark. And so if you're missing something it is possible to copy and paste those bits in. And we do have plans for being, building user extendable libraries. The big difference is if we write it and, and ship it with the binary, it'll be a much faster version of that. So there's a reason that the data frame, like the way that the C underlying, C is an underlying language for pandas and all of the functions are written to be much faster in a lower level um, language like C. And then yeah. Python becomes the sort of like way that you call into those fast um, paths. Uh, we have a very similar setup where the underlying language is actually Go, and you can talk to it through the Starlark API. And so we'll make the data frame implementation quick, um, and but that means that it's better written on the side of the fence in the Go side of the world. Is there a Go equivalent of Pandas data frame? Because I was trying to find it, I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah, find there, one. there, there are some efforts, but the the two really don't mix together very well because right. Go that doesn't have generics and yeah. is uh, strongly typed, and so it's it's very difficult to bring the API over. Uh, there have been some efforts, um, but I think if you want to do data stuff in Go, uh, there are yeah, you basically have to bend the data frame API, which is challenging and frustrating. Um, but yeah. Cool. So, it, so do you think it, it sounds like, yeah, it's great to know that you have this like concrete use case that you're thinking about um, with these sort of GitHub actions, building these small discrete things that are running repeatedly. Yeah. So, so currently, uh, well, we actually did a project for the mayor's office and, and it's called recovery, recovery data partnership. Uh, they, they basically sign agreements with uh, data providers in different uh, private sector companies, like locational intelligence, uh, like uh, point of interest visitation, all that. And they want to bring up, uh, they want to build this uh, data pipeline that brings data and filter, transform, st standardize, uh, integrate um, together. and and store it in like this one uh, repository so that all city agencies can use it. And, and we had to build that, but because of resource constraints, uh, we basically had to use really janky and uh, I don't know, just uh, terrible ways to build this data pipeline that relies on GitHub Actions to schedule things for us because we just don't have enough people to manage like an airflow server and everything has to be behind the city firewall. So, mm -hmm. so we actually use GitHub Actions heavily just for the exact same purpose. Uh, so, so, so if we can find a way to like get data from uh, like some very common places like a Postgres database, uh, mm -hmm. um, S3 and um, uh, or like a URL, a, S a SFTP site, uh, mm -hmm. or doing API requests and those things, uh, it would definitely solve like all of our use cases. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think we could, a couple of things that'll show up. One, you'll be able to do, are you running into any sort of resource constraints with GitHub Actions? Like, are you having to be careful about the way you write your scripts to make sure you don't 
use up uh, other machines memory or not anything. really yeah that's great to hear. I, I yeah that. they're are magic. pretty generous <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely <laughs> very generous with resources um yeah. surprisingly yeah but it's great to hear um and I, I genuinely hope that stays that way um the one the ideally one of the big upsides you'll get this way is because this is purpose-built for doing streaming data work um you should be able to keep the whole the whole thing running in a much more snappy uh, way than you would with github actions but you get all of the same benefits with the one other upside of you could actually run it locally on your internal systems if you want it but it sounds like the setup of airflow type thing is actually part of the problem like you don't have someone on staff who can stand yeah. up the server and keep it running we basically need like a scheduling service that's out of the box ready to use that doesn't require a whole lot of configurations totally. so so this is definitely something very useful. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, well then yeah. we got we have to hurry up and get this going for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome and really delightful to hear. Uh, yeah, and, and it's kind of like, uh, reminds me of like Zapier or yeah. uh, those if, like, like no code this, solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it would be awesome if we don't actually have to code if like, and there are connectors already built for those things. Then you just click a button, and uh, the code is like pre-formatted. Pre you just fill in, yeah. You just fill in your credentials, and uh, cool. things and go from one place. Wired to up to that database, yeah, absolutely. And so for the for the connections between things, particularly with stuff like databases, um, very much we're very much thinking that way of like, okay, cool. Here's your Postgres connector. Run your query, and you'll get the results in the next cell. Um, and, and we'll be, we'll be able to sort of store the connection credentials in secrets the same way you can with, um, other tools like CI. Um, so oh, nice. keep the sensitive data in the sensitive places. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's definitely part of, part of the plan. Um, and I think that that'll actually be easier to write than some of the other bits. Um, yeah, I guess on the question of code, no code code. So you, you know how to use pandas, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so knowing how to use pandas, would you still have any interest in sort of like something like no code solutions that are like, cool, pivot, like pivot this table or filter this data set? Or would you prefer to stick with just because you know pandas, you would rather look up the pandas version of it and write the code that does that step. And you're more interested in no code solutions for sort of the data ingest side of things. Uh, I know pandas, but I would definitely uh, have to look up the documentation every time I use something like Pivot because there's so many different functionalities and I just can't remember these things on top of my head. Uh, yeah, so it would be useful, uh, but, but not mission critical. It's something that we can probably figure out one way totally. or another. Yeah. So if, if instead we provided like a really like code snippets that were like, hey, I want to pivot this and that drop, you hit a button and that gives you a pandas snippet that does that. Yeah. Thing. Or if there's like hinting, um, uh, yeah. like syntax hinting, uh, then th that would be cool. Sort of just or, help you explore or, the API. Yeah. Or if there's a way to just write SQL queries to do the transformation, mm -hmm. then that would be the easiest solution. And uh, yeah, and it would be the most accessible to both um, like data engineers and, or business analysts who totally. don't really know how to code, but still understand SQL. Interesting. Very, very good point. That's actually very doable given that we've already written SQL on data sets into query. Um, fun, okay. Well, we can, we yeah, can elevate I, that as a priority. I, I think for pandas, uh, most people just use uh, the filtering functions and um, aggregate. It, 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 the, the use cases are very similar to SQL, so. Totally, totally. The two, there's so much overlap between what you commonly do with pandas and what you commonly do with um, a SQL database. But I think you have to like nice things that we, I think we all take for granted like drop NA or like remove this column type stuff. It's quite, quite helpful from the Panda side. Um, cool. This is really exciting. Um, yeah, so 
by you. Is there anything that we didn't ask you about there? That any, I just want to leave some open time for like thoughts that you had on this system. Like, uh, yeah, there's lots I could gesture you at, but anything. Yeah. So, um, so I didn't know Querymatic existed. And when I asked my questions in the query discord, I was actually thinking about, oh, how do I just use GitHub Actions to create the CSV, then use the query CLI to mm. ship it? And that's like what I thought would be the most convenient way to automate uh, mm. a data set. Um, but then, of course, uh, something like Querymatic would definitely resolve that issue. So, so, so if like my dream would be having like a, a query GitHub action uh, in the GitHub action store that's ready to use, I, I can just plug things in, then publish my data set to query that would uh, that be really sense. convenient. And, totally. and a lot of our stuff are actually running on GitHub actions. We run like a pretty small data operation. So, so we use GitHub Actions for free, so we don't have to manage mm -hmm. uh, or procure servers. So, and, and our data storage is just S3. Uh, after mm -hmm. we generate a table, we just dump it to S3. That's but, but then it's hard to discover and you don't know how the data looks like. There's no metadata support. So, so if query can just be a plugin and replace that, uh, what S3 serves for us, uh, then that would be awesome. That's great. Uh, as long yeah. as there's like an easy um, one-liner CLI that would allow us to do so. Totally. Um, that's awesome. And I love, I want to live in that world too. Uh, can I want to ask some specific questions about your dream GitHub action um, just so that we can actually like dial this in <laughs> faster. <laughs> um, uh, so at the end of the, uh, the GitHub actions that you're writing, are they producing a, a CSV file that you're storing, like that you're pumping to S3? Is that yeah. the general flow? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty and, much how we do it. Uh, we usually have a copy in our database, a copy that's a flat file for distribution. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. And and so we, if we if the first GitHub action we shipped was a, um, so it was a, basically hit this webhook, um, thing that kicks off a script on the query on the querymatic side. So we have, your in your GitHub action configuration, you you add cool. Now this is done, and the configuration we give it is, is uh, you can provide it any amount of configuration, and you would set something like file location and give it the result yeah. of this three URL. Yeah. Yeah. And then that would be passed um, to Querymatic as like, cool, we'll suck this down and turn this into a query. Right, so, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That would be awesome. It, it's kind of like uh, how GitHub Actions um, uh, artifacts is mm -hmm. yeah, used. Totally. Uh, yeah. If the um, the syntax or the structure could be similar to something looking like that, then uh, it would be so useful to us. And we would we would be like very ready to pump a lot of things to query. Mm. Uh, yeah, because we, we still rely on S3 and it's difficult to use and for most people. Uh, totally, so. who like don't have that sort of uh, ease of, I just wanted to understand this or yeah, you, you, you're sort of given either raw URLs or you have to build some sort of like front end face on it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you, you mentioned at the top that you were sort of in charge of taking a lot of these disparate data sources and, and sort of turning them into analysis for others to use. One of the things we would be able to provide on top of that is imagine a world where we've shipped this GitHub action uh, in, the, in the action store. You're, you've wired it up. And so now this like set of query data sets are being created. On the query side, you could then create data sets that depend on those data sets. Do you follow? Uh, right, you could right. basically say, join those together very much in the DAG flow uh, from the Databricks example that you were talking about, where now when one of those data sets does update, the downstream data sets can be automatically rerun. And re yeah, that would be awesome because we don't have that in GitHub Actions right now. Each one right. of the workflows are separated Silo. and yeah. they don't know how to talk to each other. And uh, yeah, that's that's definitely something we need. Uh, 
And we were actually thinking like, maybe we should switch to something else just to have that waiting, um, that DAG looking functionality. Property. Yeah. Yeah. Where you, have, you have three data sets that you need to aggregate into one. And basically you want to just keep, if one, any one of those three upstream data sets changes, you need, you need the, yeah. the combination of the three to update. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Does, yeah. Um, do you, so when you have to do that now, do you just, is it just someone manually triggering whenever you're, you know, like you have to just keep track of it with a human and then fire things up? Uh, right now, because it, because GitHub Actions is so plugged into the GitHub ecosystem, we just like open up an issue or comment build to trigger a build or like label good to go. Uh, so, mm, okay. so it's not so much as uh, manually tr um, sending a command or uh, it's more convenient for people who are just in charge of maintenance tasks to do it without having the data engineers to monitor it at all time. Yeah, so that's how we kind of made it more accessible. So you, and you set it up, I mean, you automated it, but then somebody else can trigger it is what you're saying, right? Somebody yes. who's less technical can just like make a new uh, issue. Yeah, basically click a button. Off. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they can actually do it in the in the graphical interface. Yes. Cool. That's yeah, cool. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, I don't know, Brennan, I'm, I'm just I'm thinking about all the like, you know, if we have this like series of connected data sets that are all flowing through each other, you know, do we then I'm just something that hasn't come up yet in our talking is like, can we have the like person that only has permission to execute but not edit you know stuff like that just something to think about yeah totally um yeah we should say that some of that by the the uh, uh access control and permissions are on the roadmap for this uh, but for now it'll kind of be of this vibe of like you'll have all of your data it'll be private to your user um and the sharing will be basically yeah read write execute those will be the three things that you'll be able to sort of delegate um, in the early version of this. Right. But, uh, another uh, thing that would be super useful is uh, we run a lot of data sets through uh, GitHub Actions, but it just goes to like a staging URL. Uh, mm -hmm. So because we don't 100% trust that's yeah, automated. Whole, so, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I wish to do some like quality a control. Publish yeah. like a release button that mm. that's like actual a release, similar to how GitHub is has released. Totally. Those are like the official, actual, not beta uh, yeah. of data sets. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we've already, yeah. So. You're, I, I think you're already familiar with Query Cloud, but like that's why we are experimenting with the notion of, you know, like that's kind of the benefit of Query is that once these things exist, you can just pick them up and move them, you know, move them around basically, yeah. um, and that that's the equivalent. I mean, whether it gets hosted on Querymatic or Query Cloud, uh, we'll figure out. But like that, that's the idea is that you can flip a switch and say, this this subset of these is now you know accessible to a larger group of people or the public or whatever. Um, versus like the, the initial collection of just internal data sets. And I think- I see, I yeah, see. Yeah, I think that's where we're headed. But yeah, like one of the first, like one of the first on completion tasks is yes, automatically push this up to Query Cloud so it's public, you know, every single time it runs. Um, but I could totally imagine like a, you know, a clearinghouse or like an email, like I guess integrated email notification where like, you know, you can, or, or Slack notification or something where somebody, where a human can like, just you know, quickly intervene by looking at a little report or something, and just saying, "Okay, look like LGTM, you know, boop," and now it's public. Um, so requiring like a either either thorough and, and complex you know validation step or just a like you know quick check, and as long as somebody somebody had eyes on it at some point, that might be helpful. That's interesting. Yeah, is that something uh, like is the querymatic notebook looking page? can also serve like a mini report. Yes, yeah. And so it'll, it, it can do a number of, you, we've got two planned reports. One is the generic one that will generate for you um, that 
can do changes between versions. And so I can see a change report since the last time this thing was generated. Um, but the other bit that we're planning is sort of the capacity to build out, hey, what basically custom reports based on data. Um, not quite data viz. We're not really talking about doing like full hardcore visualizations of stuff. We still think that the better place to do analysis work is with exploratory data analysis tools like Jupyter Notebooks. Right. Um, but as Chris was mentioning, like validation steps would have pretty beautiful UI behind them. So you can say stuff like this value should stay, like all of these values needs to stay inside of this polygon that represents New York City and anything outside of it should be displayed as a um, as an error. That's as an example type of validation step, just thinking out loud here. But the, uh, the idea there would be you would, you would actually get like a better display of validation um, in a way that would give you, okay, cool. This uh, I'll, giving somebody who is going to hit that button, this is good to go, a better set of tools for auditing whether or not that data set is ready for publication. Um, and for every type of data, that's a little different, but that's kind of one of the things on our roadmap of, of validation is to have the validation actually have a display that is interpretable without knowing how the code works type thing. Right. Okay. Um, cool. Would that be helpful? Or is yeah. there any way we can shift that to be more helpful? Uh, well, we we also built um, like QAQC visualization web apps that's just plugged directly into the database or into S3. Uh, there's this thing called Streamlet. Uh, it's like a Python based um, data viz machine learning um, thing that allows you to uh, allows Python uh, users to quickly write up a uh, web app that does data viz. And so, so we rely on that for a lot of our QAQC checks because it's always easier to look at graphs than numbers. Than the actual thing, yeah. And so I think yeah. the like the short the short answer because you mentioned Streamlit directly is like using Query Python, you should be able to say, oh cool, a new version exists. Go to yeah. any Jupyter Notebook and call, use actually use Streamlit to visualize the data itself. And so you would be able to use that and integrate it with Query as is, um, just because yeah, that's a, a wonderful tool and we could. I don't think we'll build a better thing than Streamlit. <laughs> yeah. to, to be blunt. <laughs> no, that's. I mean, that's the kind of thing though. I could see. You know, as long as you let me like. As long, sorry, when I say you, I mean us. Uh, as long as Query lets me, uh, Querymatic lets me like customize the template of the email I send, then I can. Yeah. You know, oh, right. As long as the CSV is exposed somewhere, or maybe it's maybe it's exposed with like a obscure URL, so it's not so totally public, but at least the 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 you know new version exists uh, a thing I already built that knows you know that should be visualizing this data should be able to pick it up um, and just let me customize the email template that I get when the job runs and then I can you know click on the link and go to my thing that I built that has nothing to do with Querymatic um, you know is just kind of a downstream thing I, I could totally see that being like a joyful workflow that would be really cool. Good to know. Yeah, Chris, Chris has been brewing heavily on this customizable email template uh, for a minute. Got some, yeah, okay, that's great to know. Um, I had one other question that I really wanted to ask about. Oh, um, surrounding that uh, distribution side of things. So when you publish something, uh, so we're thinking about this like cool, everything works, and someone's going to get someone who isn't one of your data engineers gets a button that says, "All right, publish this." What would need to be able to happen there? Would you need to move that data to a portal? Do you is there like a special script that would need to run? Is uh, like how complex is the publication step? I guess is my question. At your organization. yes, so we write our own. Well, we have a batch script uh, that can be called like a CLI. You just say something, something, publish this. Gotcha. And it moves it from a staging folder to a publication folder. Gotcha. And are yeah. you doing that with a GitHub action as well? Uh, not yet because it's still um, only very few uh, gotcha. data sets are using that. But but right. but yes, uh, we are using GitHub Actions. So so actually um, for Seeker, the 
the environmental um, quality review, uh, the, the planning labs app, we supply their data and there's a monthly update of the Department of uh, Environmental Protection data, mm. permits data that uh, that's scheduled to run automatically at the beginning of uh, every month. And every time it finishes running, uh, we have an action to create an issue to uh, ping someone to actually review uh, the outputs. Then once uh, that person comments publish, uh, then the file is gonna get uh, taken, uh, get moved from public uh, from staging into publish. Then gotcha. we just close out the issue. So, so there is like this um, uh, workflow cycle. That's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and that's I guess that's was mainly what I'm wondering is like cool. We're thinking about how we could use query to like make that data like add readmes, make that more useful. Um, why are that going from GitHub to query with the web? Uh, with a sort of integrated action. And so now the question is just going back, right? Like, can we make sure that the completion hook fires a webhook back into your universe, uh, potentially with GitHub Actions right. that allows you to like, right. basically do whatever you want um, on the scripting side, or should we be thinking about moving some of that side of stuff into query? But it sounds like you've got GitHub Actions as your sort of like general review and QA workflow. And it, I don't see why we wouldn't just support that with some sort of post back. Um, yeah, and and uh, we also started using um, so for Microsoft Teams, they have this approval thing. Basically, mm. you can also do very much the same thing. Something gets triggered by like a merge or like a um, PR or whatever, then it would in the in the Teams channel, it's going to ask you, uh, would you like to approve this? And you just have to click a button, approve or not approve to publish some things. And, right. and that's because Microsoft owns GitHub. So right. they have better integrations now. Totally, totally. And so that's, that makes a lot of sense. And so, but to the, you could imagine a world where you're published, you could be even on a per data set basis tuning how publication works and looks. And so maybe we should make it configurable and as pluggable as possible so that there's a sort of interrupt loop there. Right, because ideally I wouldn't have to like r run a command on my machine At to yeah. publish something. Yeah, yeah. and and it would be useful for someone else to know like this is officially published uh, totally. by this event. Yeah, no, and that makes a lot of sense. And so yeah, we could really see that being query being useful for the adding of metadata, um, versioning of that data telling you what changed to make that review process a little easier and then ideally firing off that last step asking for review which would then theoretically be connected to a webhook um, somewhere else on some other service that makes sense so far yeah yeah that that makes perfect sense awesome why wow, we're, we're gonna I, I think we have a goal and it's to make your life easier <laughs> <laughs> That, this that was really, really helpful. <laughs> this, this is really, really helpful. Um, yeah, we're, we're very excited about this automation stuff, but it actually, it's really delightful to hear about folks who could actually make good use of it at work. Um, yeah. And so I, I think I, I have a million more questions, but I, I don't want to keep badgering you. I, you're on our Discord. And so we, may, we, we, have, we have to go make this and then get you in on the beta as soon as we can to make sure that this works for your needs. Um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Amazing. So from here, I'm, I'm just going to say a huge thank you for taking some time to talk through um, this early prototype with us. And uh, yeah, this is really great. And we'll, we will absolutely follow up and try and make this work exactly with the GitHub Action integration sort of workflow. It's a really nice, um, it's a really great place to test this out. Yep. Thank you yeah, so much. By, by the way, as soon as, uh, like, literally the second we have like a login on this thing, um, I'll We'll reach out and like get make sure that you can like kick Yay. the tires on it. Yeah. Also, I want to have like a uh, city planning with uh, the verified check mark still there uh, right next to my username. Uh, yes, totally. Yeah, we will. That do would that. motivate me to pump everything <laughs> into query because <laughs> everything is already public, but just in very obscure places. Totally, totally. We will get considering the folks who would be deciding who is and is not verified are in this 
call. <laughs> we, we can do the vetting. <laughs> this, this is a whole other realm of, of data nerdiness. <laughs> totally, totally. No, I, I, I know the feeling of the blue check mark. It's, um, I don't know it because I don't have one, but uh, um, <laughs> we should start giving them to ourselves, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bobby, for taking some time. This is delightful. We'll, as Chris mentioned, we'll absolutely be following up, um, get you in on this beta. ASAP. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, my pleasure. You've given us lots of lots to talk about on the GitHub Action integration side of things. It's really exciting.